All right, welcome everybody. Uh, our webinar for FUSE training. Um, this is June 21st here in Spokane, Washington. Uh, welcome. I'm really happy that you guys have joined us. Um, of course, we will send this link out after we're finished so people can see it uh, at their leisure. And uh, just want to say uh, it is a fantastic June so far. So we have seen a lot of closed deals. We've seen a lot of people make a lot of money. We've had multiple 70,000 plus commissions this month. So that's right, $70,000 check and we're taking $179 out of that. So um, smoking deal, um, they are out there. Um, but most of them are not that big. They are just regular checks, typically three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000, 6000 depends on the market. And um, how we get those checks is basically through this process. So today we're gonna focus on paperwork on the selling side. If you're not familiar with that, it's, it's kind of confusing. Um, Washington State makes a lot of things confusing. So if you're in Washington State, Lord help you. Because um, here in the state, <clears throat> uh, there's brokers, managing brokers, and, and designated brokers. In the rest of the country, there's just a broker and an agent. So uh, someone's ego got in the way of that decision. So that's confusing. But then on the paperwork side, <clears throat> a listing agent is someone who is listing a house and some people think of it as selling a house because they're listing it, but that's not the case. The selling side is the buyer's side. So just don't get too confused. There's a listing side and a selling side, and those are the official terms for it. Today we are going to talk about the selling side. And we're going to kind of go in step by step what you need to do to make sure that you have good paperwork, that it's clean, that you make a good offer, you get it accepted, especially in this white hot market, um, depending on where you are. But it's hot everywhere, everywhere. and that's not just a metaphor. Um, it's really, really hot in Arizona and California right now. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, we want to we want to make sure our offers get accepted, and that's that's the goal of this. That's why we're real estate agents, professionals, and or brokers here in the lovely state of Washington. Um, we're 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 in for the money. You know, this is what we do. We want to make money applying our trade. And so <clears throat> it does start with clean paperwork. Every state in the union requires clean paperwork. And what that means is a clean contract. Everything from a listing agreement to a buyer's representation agreement to seller disclosures, you know, property disclosures to everything, exhibit A's. Um, and then all the contract paperwork has to be signed, initialed, has to be clean. Um, and we'll go over what clean means. And so we're going to get into a lot of stuff today. This is going to be a full class. Uh, if you're not familiar with our webinars, <clears throat> please go ahead and uh, ask questions on the chat side. So just kind of pop them in there. Alex is, uh, he's our producer, so he sees them. He'll let me know if I don't catch them. So my screen is divided to uh, what you guys see. And then I've got a picture of me, and and, uh, and I've got kind of a little thing over here that tells me who is asking what questions and so on and so forth. So um, that is about it. Looks like we have, as we kick this thing off, we've got about 11 attendees. Um, typically, people come and go during these things, so and that's fine. They can garner off of it what they can. Uh, we just want to make sure that we teach you guys the right way and successful way to do um, real estate. Okay. And if you don't know, I drink a lot of tea and water because, well, you know, hydration is important. Um, great. So selling paperwork. So, you know, we go into the MLS. And here, again, I'm going to use Spokane because we use Paragon, which we use in many, many different MLSs is probably the most used software for real estate. Matrix in, in the Northwest MLS and Flex MLS has their own software in North Idaho and the RMLS has their own software. So there's variations to what we're doing, but effectively these documents are pretty much the same. So these, these documents are where we start. Well, kind of, I guess we start with the listings in the MLS. So here in Spokane, uh, this MLS, let me log into it, will show us our listings. 
So every MLS, they've got active listings, they have contingent listings, they have pending listings, they have sold listings. And so you really have to be careful of what you're looking at. One of the problems with some of the websites out there, especially Zillow and, and others, they don't differentiate between an active listing and a pending or contingent listing. They're trying to improve that, and I've seen some progress there. But a lot of times you'll get calls from people, a client, who's like, hey, you know, I went on to the MLS, and, uh, and I saw that this house is available. It's like, well, that house really isn't available. It's been pending for two weeks. Um, and that's why a search engine that is more accurate is always better. Ours at kellywright.com is really, really accurate. We have a direct IDX feed from the MLSs, and uh, we go through diverse solutions, a third-party vendor that basically cleans it up, makes it pretty and presentable, but also makes it accurate. So um, Zillow, I bring that up because people just go to these different websites, and we have to manage that. So when they come to us and say, hey, you know, I saw this house on Zillow. Can we go take a look at it? Well, then you got to verify if it's really even active. And we want to direct them away from those kind of websites to us as professionals. Say, hey, I will send you listings, and those are the ones that are pertinent to what you're looking for, and those are the ones we're going to go with. Um, so they get into the, you get into the MLS, and you search. And you can do residential, commercial, for rent, multi-class. But we'll just do a standard vanilla um, search. And I won't get into the searching part of it. You guys can play with the MLS a little bit. Um, I'm going to actually do, uh, we'll do one of my listings. We'll do uh, up to 350. And I only want active. So I take out contingent. So contingent other, contingent the sale of the buyer's home, contingent upon inspection, contingent upon short sale. I don't want pendings. I want active, back on market, new price change extended, back on market released. These are the opportunities I can actually find. And then there's a map search, and then I'm going to go up into a neighborhood where I've got a listing. And we are going to go from there. And my computer is very, very slow. So I want to make sure our devices are turned off so we're not eating up. So yeah, we are not eating up bandwidth. Okay, there we go there. Get this thing done. Did the, Alex, will you hand, uh, give me a hand and close my door for me? Do, do, do. Yeah. So Wi-Fi off. Good. Okay. Thank you. So let's go back up here and let's take a look at this neighborhood where I have a listing. And so you search for it, and you get in here, and bam, 329. God, let's see, what are you doing? What are you doing to me, Mr. Slow Computer? I think I need these. Okay, search now, five. And this guy. Okay. So here's a listing, and your client says, okay, great. I'm really interested in this house at 4412 South Magnolia Street. I want to buy this house. And, you know, certainly you go look at them. And if you're not familiar with how that works, you, usually what I do is I set a list of properties that I want my client to look at. I think it's going to fit their needs. So I'll set up a list of, you know, 10 Say, okay, Saturday morning, let's go for coffee at 8 a.m. Always be careful because lockboxes can be uh, turned off until a certain time, typically 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. So you want to verify if you're going to go for an early morning showing or late at night, um, you might not be able to get in if the lockbox has a timer on it. So make sure that make sure that's taken care of and then go check these houses out. And so then they go, okay, we've looked at these houses, love this one on Magnolia Street. I want to make an offer. Now, an offer is, is, is a very delicate process, especially in this hot market. We actually had someone late last night that in Seattle that was making an offer on a $1.6 million house. It was listed for $1.4, and they went $200,000 above asking price to $1.6, and they still didn't get the house. Someone came along with cash and gave them 1.6 cash, and they needed some financing. So it's a crazy market. So typically, 
there's art and science to this. You want to make sure that you're getting your client the best deal, but don't over-negotiate. I can't emphasize that enough. Do not over-negotiate. Um, don't think of yourself as this fantastic negotiator lawyer that's just going to hammer those buyers and sellers, you know, depending on the situation. You're going to lose out there. You want to be, you want to give your clients the best deal possible, but you also have to realize the marketplace. And in this marketplace, I anticipate getting a pretty good offer. If this one is priced a little bit high, we're going to get an offer, I think, probably for 320 325 something like that. But... Um, you have to, it's a delicate balance. People that are selling houses, sometimes they're pricing them too high, depending on the marketplace. And then other people are um, pricing them even too low and they generate multiple offers. So we'll get into that. But let's stick with this one. And again, I have to, I have to, I have to be kind of quick. There's a ton I could talk about, um, but we only have a two and a half hours. So I don't want to, I don't want to really go overboard on this. But so you show your, your client these houses, they love this one on Magnolia, they want to make an offer on it, and you go, okay, great, let's make an offer. At that point, I say, I'll get back to you in a little bit. Let me do some research on this house. I want to look at certain things. I want to verify the taxes on it. Um, certain things I always look at, I'll look at the county assessor's website. Uh, let's see, Spokane Assessor. So I'll look at the county assessor website, and I want to make sure I know who the owner is. I want to know um, kind of what the taxes are on this. Um, some people get shocked by taxes. They will, you know, they buy this house, and they're like, oh, great, this payment's going to be great. And then they get shocked by it, especially in Seattle. Taxes, uh, property taxes doubled in the last eight years in Seattle. So, you know, you get, you see this dream house, but all of a sudden your tax bill is $800 a month. And it's like, yikes. Um, this one's not that high. So check out the tax assessor's website first. So there's a picture of the house, parcel information. His name's Gordon Moore. His wife died a few years ago, so that change has been made, and it's just in Gordon's name. We call him Flash. <laughs> He's a good guy, 90-year-old retired physician. Uh, so we look at the house information and I verify taxes. Tax value is 244. So we're above that, but that's what happens in this hot market. I can verify the land size, um, 13,399 square feet. And then I can look at all this information. Every assessor's got a little bit different information, but the same information. Build 1965, central air, forced air, blah, blah, blah. We get into this, ah, there's the taxes, 1333, or I'm sorry, three, uh, $3,333 a year. So I make sure that everything looks good there, um, nothing out of place. And so I go back to my listing, I say, okay, um, I think this is a pretty good price for this. What are you willing to pay? And they say, well, it's a hot market. We've lost a bunch of houses lately. We just want to give them a full price offer. I said, well, that's probably smart. Let's say Seattle, Portland, North Idaho's hot. Everywhere's hot. I mean, it's just you have to you have to really think about it's a seller's market. Do we want to give them a full price offer? Or in the case of the offer last night in Seattle, escalate. And sometimes you escalate $10,000 above asking. Sometimes you escalate, in last night's case, $200,000 above asking. So you escalate and you really get um, – it really gets heated and competitive. Let's, uh, hopefully that's not going to be the case with this one. So we'll just make it a simple full price offer. And I'm going to need this MLS number because in transaction desk is where I'm going to make the offer. So it's 329. I go back over here. I get into transaction desk. Now this is the kind of the automated software, paperwork software that we use in Spokane and the Northwest MLS in Seattle, Tacoma, Bellingham. Um, they use it in a few different other markets, but for the most part, there's a form simplicity, transaction desk. There's a automated system in almost every MLS now. So make sure you understand that system. In this one, I'm uh, the agent here. <clears throat> if you don't know, I can actually, just to let you know, I can view as a broker. So for all of you out there, I can see your transactions, um, not just in Spokane, in Tri-Cities, in Portland, Boise. I can see them everywhere. 
So a lot of times if you have questions, I'll just go into the file you've already created and make some adjustments or review it in there. But in this case, I just want it to be me as an agent. And I'm going to go ahead and create a transaction. So the name on this is going to be, <clears throat> um, we're going to call it uh, Vesselitz. Vesselitz. That's Alex. Hi, Alex. Um, it says residential listing or residential sale. This is going to be a residential sale. Source, Paragon, Paragon. And that's why I cut and paste the Paragon number. So I've got the MLS number in there. And I'm going to be the selling agent on this. And then I create. Okay, new transaction created. So what's happening here is the software is pulling that MLS number up. It's creating this transaction that we can now develop the paperwork to make an offer on this house. So we're sitting here with our clients going, okay, Mr. Vesselitz, I want to uh, make, you want to make an offer on this house. I want to help you with that. Let's do this in an automated way. Let's say Mr. Vesselitz is in Barcelona today because he's traveling with his entourage, his posse, and he's having a good time sipping sangria <laughs> down on the beach, And but he still wants to make an offer oh, on man. the house. We can make this thing work. Actually, I think it's how it's like uh, 8 p.m. there, 6 p.m., something like that. Anyway, so uh, Mr. Vesselitz is there in Europe. He's having a good time, but we can still get him to sign this offer. I'll show you how. So we've got some information in here, but now we're going to have to really fill out a bunch more information. So residential sale transaction is open. You can say active, but just keep it open. No big deal. The address shows up here, the year built there. And we're going to do a purchase price of $329. Asking $329, purchase price of $329. We're going to give them full asking. The purchase date, well, um, we're going to create today's date because that's the transaction date. It doesn't matter if everything gets signed three or four days from now. The transaction date will remain consistent. <clears throat> so when you add an addendum, when you go back and forth negotiating over the next few days, let's say, the transaction day of today still is pegged to this transaction. Those documents can be dated different dates, but the transaction date is set in stone. So it's going to be June 21st. Offer expiration. Well, we want to make sure that they've got time to review. And again, this is a little bit more art than science. Some people in a hot market will panic and they'll go, you know what, I'm going to give you till today at nine. And it's 10 o'clock and you know, that's just too much. It's, it's um, The seller could be, they could be off at a cabin for the weekend and they have no internet. They can't get to the offer. It's just not enough time. So communicate. Look at the listing. You can go back at the listing. It might say here <coughs> in agent remarks, please call listing agent, set an appointment. And in there, it could say give us 48 hours to, for offers. Uh, seller is elderly and we need 72 hours, whatever it's going to be. So you're going to want to follow their instructions. Don't upset them by not following their instructions. Just understand that they need more time. Um, there's people out there that feel pressure. These agents feel pressure. They've lost houses in these bidding wars, these multiple offer scenarios. And they're like, look, you know, I wanna, I'm going to give you six hours to accept this, and then we're going to move on. And that, that's fine, but um, it puts a lot of pressure on the, the, both the buyer and the seller. Uh, so I typically will do 24 hours. Um, I would even do 72 hours, but one of the more important things to do is call the other agent and say, hey, I'm bringing you an offer. Number one, do you have any other offers on the table? They might say, oh, yeah, we've got three that came in today. Um, in this hot market, I wouldn't, a lot of people suggest that maybe they're lying or fabricating that just so that they bump up the purchase price. But typically, it's true. There's, there's, it's a hot market. There's lots of people that are um, looking for houses right now. So let's say they've got three or four offers. Let's say, well, when are you going to review those offers? So we're going to review them tomorrow at 5 p.m. It's like, okay, I've got, I've got two full days, just about. So um, communicate with the other agent and figure out what's a good time to, to, to um, put an offer expiration date in there. Um, and in, in an even market where it's not, it's not a buyer's market, it's not a seller's market, it's just a good market, that's typically when I do uh, 48 hours to have that offer. So 
Today's the 21st, we'll do the 23rd. Mutual acceptance, closing date, if they accept it on the 23rd, you know, this is where you kind of talk to the lender, Louis, the lender, and it's like, okay, we're out about 30 days for uh, loans to get done. So let's just do the 31st. Um, one important thing is on a closing date, never do a Friday. Fridays are awful uh, because if it closes on a Friday, sometimes the assessor's office, um, they're closed at noon. So the county clerk, is they shut down at noon. Um, so there's a lot of things that can go wrong or you need a one-day extension. And Fridays are just awful. So try to make it. I've got it on a Monday here. It could be on a Thursday. But avoid Fridays because if things happen, you've got the weekend now to contend with. You've got people moving in, moving out, hotels. I mean, it could just become a mess. So, yeah, I like to do a Monday's good, Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, or Thursday. That's all good. In this case, the 31st looks good. We've got, and it can always be sooner, too. A lot of people will say, well, um, you know, we want to get this thing closed right away. But you can always close it sooner. Email to hackers remotely. Please call us immediately at the toll-free number listed so that our support engineers Alex, can walk you to the phone. Where's that caller? If you close this page, you. Okay. Yeah, let's make sure. Alex, we go through the list and make sure everyone's muted. Um, we've got enough background noise. And we've got things going on with phones ringing and, and everything else. So... <clears throat> Let's make sure we're all muted and that uh, everyone can hear me cleanly. Okay, so we're going to go on to the next. We've got some dates in there. Uh, looks like, well, I'm the listing broker and the selling broker. Kelly Wright Real Estate, Spokane, Spokane. Okay, next. Uh, forms. This is where we're basically adding all these forms. So we're going to add them. And this will pull in some forms from the statewide, statewide forms. We'll start with that. Now, this is where I'm going to get into the buyer's agency agreement. Um, we'll take a little side note here. If you have a listing, you have to have a listing agreement. So we talked about this last week, that exclusive sale and listing agreement, you have to have that. You don't have to have a buyer's agreement. Some firms say absolutely get a buyer's agency agreement. And that's fine, but really what's happening there is it doesn't mean anything. The state doesn't care. The courts don't care. You can't hold a buyer to that contract. It's kind of a fake contract. The only advantage is that maybe, just maybe, the buyer doesn't know that. And so the buyer's like, you know what? I can't work with any other agents. I'm locked in to this guy, Joe Kelly. And even though I think he's an awful agent, I've got to still work with him for the, you know, the, the remainder of the contract. Um, hopefully people don't say that, but it does happen where they don't, they're, they're not happy with their agent. And it's for a variety of reasons. It, it could be you didn't answer the telephone within three minutes of when they called. I mean, as the designated broker in all these markets, I hear the crazy stories. So when things get crazy, it comes to me. Um, I should be a therapist. So uh, the buyer's agency agreement is really just kind of that connection between you and the buyer saying, okay, you know what? There's a little bit of pain if you try to go to another agent and use them. But the people that know this document doesn't isn't really valid. They just they use and abuse agents. And so you really want to develop a good rapport, a good relationship, really make sure that they trust you, you do a good job for them, and then you're going to be safe through this buying process. Um, so as we go through these, we want to make an offer again. So we want to start with our Form 21, Residential Purchase and Sale Agreement. We definitely want that. That's the number one form. The number two form is often in my book, the financing addendum. So financing contingency protects the buyer a little bit. It says, hey, this deal is predicated on them getting financing. If they cannot get financing, the deal is dead. And this financing addendum survives the contract. So um, you can parties can waive it, of course. But, and, and, but if the financing addendum is in place, it goes all the way up to closing. And if at the last second... Let's say this knucklehead buyer went out and bought a big monster truck and he's got a $600 a month payment now. His debt to income gets out of whack and, uh, and now he can't buy the house. So that does happen. And remember, every lender will check their credit seconds before they push the button to fund the loan. 
So there's there's some funny things that happen out there. And when I say funny, I mean sad. Um, I've seen buyers buy furniture. They go to Macy's and they take out a credit card and they buy $5,000 worth of furniture because they're like, oh, I'm so excited. I'm getting this house, but I need to furnish it. Well, guess what? You just screwed up your credit and now your debt to income ratio is out of whack and you're not getting a loan and you're not buying the house. So anyway, the financing addendum is an important one and we'll talk more about that in other classes. Um, and this one we also would want to do, and again, these are Washington state forms, Oregon, Alabama, Idaho, Florida, they all have different forms, but they're kind of the same. For example, in Idaho, the financing addendum is in the purchase and sale agreement. So it's not an additional form, but it's in there. But it does have closing costs and terms and things like that. So uh, let's. what other forms are we going to do on this one? We're going to keep this one fairly simple. Optional clauses is one you can use it's kind of a weak form it adds a little bit of oomph to it or you can you can add a few things into some of the blank spaces um, we do want a home inspection but that's not the right form it's actually a form 35. this house is 1965 so it's older than 78 so we need lead-based paint and hazard disclosure that's federal law <clears throat> identification of utilities um, it's kind of a, a formality that really just allows escrow to pay the utilities bill so that the new owners don't have that, you know, they don't have a $500 heating bill that's outstanding. So it's just identifying it. It's, it's kind of a goofy form. In most cities, there's, there's only one option, but sometimes you get out in the country and there's a PUD and there's all sorts of different forms um, for that. But we're going to keep this one simple. This is in the city. They're hooked up to the sewer. Uh, so we don't need a well addendum. We don't need a septic addendum. We don't need any of these county addendums, King County septic. There's Whatcom County disclosure. Um, so there are county-wide stuff. Title contingency, I do add because title title's a goofy thing, but it, it's, again, I see all the problems. So when problems happen out there in the world, it ends up on my desk. And so we do see a lot of title problems. They're called clouds on title. It could be uh, an easement they didn't know about. It could be a lien, a mechanics lien against the property. And um, it can throw the deal out of whack. So maybe the, maybe the seller thinks they're breaking even. They've got to pay off their loan and taxes and everything else. Well, now there's a mechanics lien for $10,000 that wasn't paid 10 years ago, and it's got interest on it and all this other stuff. So now they're short. They don't have enough money to pay off their loan. So then it becomes a short sale. So title contingency. Um, and also, if that... If that um, easement is is going through the property and they don't know about it well and it, it affects their property's value then they can make a title claim later but uh, we're going to have uh, guest speakers come in later and do title insurance and do escrow and kind of talk about different things that are out there home warranties uh, right now we're going to keep moving along all these different county forms don't need them here in Spokane, pre-sale condominium. You don't need that. Don't want to do an earnest money promissory note. I would rather see the earnest money. Um, and usually with the offer to that is a copy of the check made out to the title or escrow company. Um, okay. Uh, da, 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 inspection. There's that sucker. Inspection addendum form 35. Um, in the hot markets, you know, the, the uh, ones that you've got multiple offers, the escalation addendum, that's where you're going to escalate. And we can use the Washington form in different states, but you want to take off that Northwest MLS form. We actually went through that with an attorney last week in Idaho, and they said, yep, the verbiage is just fine. You can use that here. Okay. Feasibility, I don't really need that. That's typically if you're going to build and you want to make sure it's feasible to do what you want on that property. Neighborhood review, that's kind of in the optional clauses, so we don't really need that as a separate form. And other forms, uh, commission disbursement, you might want to do that later. That's the one where you send that to escrow saying, you know, I get 3%, they get 3%, and, uh, and we sign it, and so escrow knows who's getting paid what. Um, because they don't, it's not always 3%. It could be you took uh, half your commission, you get 1.5%, and then you bumped up the selling commission to 3.5% to incent incentivize more agents to bring their clients in. 
Uh, buyer's agency agreement, that's the one I was talking about. Um, you just you really don't need that. But again, it, it, I would make it a practice. And if your uh, buyer says, you know what, I'm not going to sign that. I don't want to have an agency agreement. Say, that's fine. Let me earn your business, earn your trust, um, and, and operate that way. Uh, agency disclosure, use this one if you're doing dual agency. That way it says both you're representing both buyer and seller. So everybody's on board. They all know that you are representing both parties. In this case, I would be representing both parties, and I would use that form to, um, to let everybody know. And I think that's really it right now. Okay, so we've got these forms. Let's go ahead and add those to our, our basket. We have seven forms in there. There's a couple others we're going to want to add later on. So we've got these ones. Now, let's hit next. Aha. Now, this is where we add the other forms. So what I would do, I'd go back to the listing. I would go under reports, specialty views. And again, this is Paragon. So those of you in the Tri-Cities, this is what you would be using. Those of you up in North Idaho, up in Selkirk, this is what you'd be using. I hit Associated Docs. Oh, don't have any there. I could actually go on my desktop, and I could find, let's see, the more sale. Associate, I put my photos in there. I keep everything in this file electronically. Aha, here's the lead base paint and the uh, seller disclosure. And there's my exclusive right to sell listing agreement and all that good stuff. So... I'm going to get rid of that. I put it on here on my desktop, and then I go back over here, and I go, okay, transaction desk. Let's add two more PDFs to the file because we need them. They were already created. They were created when I got the listing agreement, and they're uh, here and ready to go to be signed digitally. And so I've got to drop and drag them into this box. Okay. So, and then in Washington State, you're going to need an Exhibit A as well. Remember that. An Exhibit A you get from the title company. Um, I don't have one yet. I'll have to go back and take a look at my listing. But it is something that we need to close the file out. So during the process, you want to make sure you get an Exhibit A initialed by all parties. Um, so in this case, we have the seller disclosure and uh, the lead-based paint and hazards. And Exhibit A will be coming and the law of agency, I'll show you that in a different way here. Okay, so we have this. Oh, actually, you know what? Let's, that's where it would be. It would be back here. Let's add forms, pamphlets. There it is, law of agency pamphlet. So I'm going to add that. So now in my forms, I've got that. And then in my PDF forms, I've got this. And now I'm done. Okay. So we've got a purchase price of $329. And we've got the property. Let's go to the details. Um, everything looks good there. Da, 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 vessel lits, anything I'm missing. So double check everything. Make sure you really understand um, what your numbers are, you don't want, we saw that this week as well, where we transpose numbers. Instead of a 265 offer, it was 256, and they didn't catch it, and the offer got rejected. So you want to make sure that the numbers are good. Take your time, go slowly, make sure everything's accurate, double check addresses, names. In this case, like I saw on title, when I went to the Spokane Assessor's Office, I saw that it was Gordon W. Moore. So I want to match that. In these documents, I wanted to say Gordon W. Moore as the seller and Alex Veselitz as the buyer. Okay. So now I'm going to go under signings. Now let's see, where are we going here? This is where I always get a little bit confused because um, we have to create the signing. So the signing is going to be Alex Veselitz, my buyer. Oh, there he is. And the transaction is going to be more, Gordon Moore. Save. Go to new signing. There 
And when we get into forms and paperwork, we'll get more into transaction desk. But right now, I'm just walking you through this so that you see that I'm going to make an offer. And again, Alex is sipping sangria in Barcelona right now, but he's actually going to make an offer on this sucker. Okay. So we have Alex Besselis, simul sign, first come, first serve. That's fine. The participants, aha, uh -huh. wait a second. We don't have Alex in here. So we're going to have to add him. Okay. So let's add a participant from the transaction. Let's see. Alex, where are you here? So let's do that again. We have to create him. So am I in Barcelona right now? I'll just do add new participant. So Alex Veselitz email Alex. Alex, what's your email? Is uh, Alex B as in Victor at Kellyride.com. At Kellyright dot com. I forgot if it was A Vesselitz or Alex V. So okay, there we go. We're going to add him, and nothing else needs to be in here. I don't like custom signatures; it kind of screws it up. Company, role, none of that matters. I just want Alex Vesselitz and his email. And he's going to be a remote signer, not an in-person, not a reviewer. He won't get the email. He's going to be a remote signer. So we're going to add him. And then you saw in there, add another. So if there's a spouse or a partner or anything like that, that's where you can add another. So let's do, um, look good. We've got all these forms in here. Exclusive right to sell lead-based paint. So that was already in the Gordon Moore file. So I didn't really need to upload those again, but at least you saw how to upload, drag and drop into that little blue box, a PDF. Good. So I guess I had done my previous work, so it's already in there. Um, we're going to add documents. So we're going to select from transaction. And so you can have, again, you can select documents, you know, PDFs that are on your desktop, wherever they are in the computer world, you can go get them and bring them into this transaction. Uh, da, 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 da. What is this transaction? Got addresses. I think I saved it under Alex Vesselitz. Oh, uh, I did not. So I got to go all the way to the V's, I think. Vesselitz, there it is. Okay. Wait a second. Seller disclosure, lead based paint. Why are those? I'm going to close this out. I'm going to try to figure out why we are not able to add. Select from transactions, select from forms. Let's see if that's what I should have hit. Transaction forms, same thing there. Nope. Dun, dun, dun. Add OneDrive email, select from. Huh, a little confused on that one. Should have gone smoother. Okay, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to I'm going to put on I'm going to stop the recording and I'm going to figure out why these are not going to start the recording again. So I should have been in the Vesselitz transaction, and that is where it got a little goofy. Okay, add, <clears throat> mm, right, we were already in here. I'm going to close this. I'm going to go back and verify these forms. So let's see here, which is probably good. So I've got law of agency. I've got all this stuff in here, agency disclosure, inspection, title, lead base, the, the general addendum, that's fantastic. Vesselitz. Go to details. Go to forms. Back home. Huh. History delete. Dang, what, what is going on with this? All right, I'm going to un <clears throat> stop the recording. 
Okay, so I found the forms. Um, I had to go back and design these, so that's I, I skipped a step. So that's that's good. That was a big step to skip. I don't want to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're going to design these forms. Basically, it's going to have Gordon's name on there. I want to make sure that all the different spaces are filled out right for this offer. There we go. So transaction desk filled in as much as it could. It did not quite take the buyer. So I'll do that here. So let's and the seller. Gordon W. Moore. Offer expiration on the 23rd. There's the MLS. The date is today for the offer. Going to keep the stove. Going to keep the refrigerator, the washer, the dryer, the dishwasher. And that is about it. 329. Earnest money. Talk to your talk to your buyers and find out how much they want to do. And something like this, three thousand dollars would be appropriate. Roughly one percent. Uh, real hot markets. Uh, Two percent might work. So there's that. And it's going to be held by the closing agent, not the selling firm. Uh, default forfeiture of earnest money. Title insurance company. Let's go with uh, First American. That's who I think I opened title with. Closing agent. We'll also do First American. This is where you'd put an attorney if they're going to be an attorney. So the title company can be Chicago Title, First American, Tycor, um, Stewart. But the closing agent can be different. That could be an attorney. That could be just a, someone who specializes, has their own little escrow company. They're an LPO. Licensed practitioner, um, and the possession date is going to be on closing. Services uh, requested by Form 22K. Charges after closing assumed by the buyer. Uh, seller is not a foreign person for U.S. income tax, and the listing broker in this case is representing both parties. Now here you can put in the different forms if you want. It doesn't really matter that much. It's it's a little bit goofy. Um, you can write it in as well, but in this case, I don't, I don't want to get into them all, but this is where you'd put in the forms that you're including in the offer. Try to make a habit of it. That's good advice if you can make a habit and get those forms in there, um, but it's not, it's not crucial. And then here's where you'd see like the listing agent. I would be in there. Selling agent, that could be Century 21 or Windermere or whomever. And their information would be pulled from the MLS and auto-populated there. And then the rest of this is just kind of boilerplate stuff, but certainly places to initial. Okay, so we've got that. And now I want to go to the next form, financing addendum. Let this thing load up. Okay, June 21st. Good. There's Alex. There's Gordon. Uh, loan application. In this case, Alex is going to do a conventional loan, and he is going to put 20% down. So that's the rule of thumb is that 20% down and you avoid mortgage insurance or PMI, primary mortgage insurance. Um, you don't have to do that. Again, we'll talk about it more in financing, but the lender will pay the mortgage insurance and the cost to the borrower is basically about a quarter to even an eighth of a point higher in interest rate. So really not that much. And it's a really good deal. So, you know, I could put in here as little as 3% down and have no mortgage insurance. Uh, so again, talk to Louie or me or Brandon if you have finance questions. But in this case, Alex has been making bank. He's he's just loaded with cash. He's going to put 20% down and keep this thing clean. And sellers Let's like put 40. Let's put 40 down. Put 40. <laughs> so they like to see that it's a clean offer. And the more money you put down, the more wiggle room you have. Because if a problem occurs, you can use that money to kind of fix the problems. Okay. So loan information, seller requested oh, 10 days if not filled in, buyer's loan information within 10 days. It also will say in the financing application, so they'll make um, application for their loan within five days. So you want to make application for your loan immediately. Again, 
harping on the lending side because I've been doing lending for 20 years as well, it's really, really important to start the process immediately within minutes of getting this or getting the uh, purchase and sale all finalized and signed around. Loans are the biggest part of the transaction. And the sooner the better. So uh, if any problems come up later with inspections or appraisals or issues, there's still time to fix them. The seller's right to terminate. Uh, this is not a, simply a right to terminate the contract. There's a misconception about that. What it's doing is basically saying we are going to terminate if you don't remove the financing contingency. Now, you can still have financing and still not have a financing contingency, if that makes sense. So um, you just have to be darn well sure that you're going to get that financing. So it's like, I've done this before. It's like, look, I know the rock's solid. We're going to get the financing. It's going to happen. But we have to remove the financing contingency. Otherwise, the seller can um, basically force us to force our hand. And then, you know, they're getting out of the contract if we don't do that. And that's where this would come in. So right to terminate 30 days. You want this to be less to protect your buyer. After mutual acceptance, seller can give notice that seller may terminate, not will, but may terminate the agreement at any time three days after delivery of that notice, right, to terminate notice. Once they do that termination notice, then it's like you have to talk to your client and say, hey, let's waive the financing contingency. You've been approved at underwriting. It's going to happen. Or they might say, you know what, it's too risky. If we don't get financing, we're going to lose our earnest money because we don't have a financing contingency in there. We want to walk away. And then all parties would walk away and the buyer would get their earnest money back because it's the seller that initiated that right to terminate notice. Again, if you get into a situation like that, email me, call me, and I'll walk you through it. But don't panic if you see that. It's not, it doesn't mean the deal's dead. It just means the financing contingency needs to be removed. Appraisal less than sales price. We're seeing a lot of that. So buyer's waiver of the financing contingency under this paragraph. Uh, will constitute waiver of paragraph seven. This is also very confusing because in paragraph seven, appraisal less than sales price. Again, don't panic over this. If the appraisal comes in low, <clears throat> then we let the seller know. Sounds like a uh, Dr. Seuss rhyme. <laughs> if the appraiser comes in low, uh, we let the seller know that it's still okay. There's a, a notice of low appraisal. And it really depends on how low it comes in. If it comes in 40000 low, well, that's a problem. If it comes in $1,000 low, most sellers will be like, you know what, that's fine. Uh, maybe the buyer can make up the difference with cash. With uh, $500, and the seller brings it down $500. There's an easy way to fix a, if it comes in close to the sales price. But if it's 40000 low, big decisions have to be made. Now, if they're doing an FHA or government appraisal, that appraisal is going to stay in the system, the government system, for six months. So if they decide to put it back on the market, that appraisal is going to rear its ugly head again for the next buyer that's using government financing. So, and they, they may say, hey, I'm going to put it back on the market and wait for the cash offer. And that can happen in a hot market. But <clears throat> if you get a low appraisal, don't panic. There's still ways to make this thing work. So, and you can read through the remedies here, reappraisal or reconsideration of value. There's a lot of different things we can do. And we'll get that more into that during the finance webinar. Okay, so this is our financing contingency, an extension of closing also because of the Dodd-Frank bill. Um, there is an automatic three-day notice for Regulation Z of the Truth and Lending Act. It's very complicated. It stinks, but if it does if, if they do need an extra three, three days to be notified and they have to wait for those three days, they can't waive it either. That's the goofy thing about that rule. Uh, they just have to wait three days. It automatically kicks in with this financing contingency. So some people, I've seen some sellers say, hey, I want out of the contract. I'm not going to extend for three days. Well, guess what, Mr. Seller? You have to extend for three days because of this contingency paragraph. And so that's a federal law. And again, we have all sorts of lenders here in our office. So if you have questions on that, go ahead and contact us. Okay, so there's the financing uh, form. Optional clauses. <clears throat> Loading. Okay, so optional clauses. This is kind of a simple form. Again, <clears throat> it's not as important as the purchase and sale agreement 
financing addendum and the inspection addendum. Those to me are the three most important. This one is more, <clears throat> is the square footage correct? You know, it gives the, the buyer time to check the property and make sure it really is 13,000 plus square feet. They might determine it's 10,000 square feet and they don't want to buy it because it's not enough room for their dogs or whatever. So usually nothing major. Standard owner coverage for title insurance should be fine. Um, an extended coverage policy becomes very expensive. So I don't think your clients are going to want it. But maybe if it's a goofy piece of property, if there are issues with that. So um, you can, again, ask any, any of the lending crew uh, what that extended coverage might cost. Um, these little things like, hey, the seller's going to clean the property. If they leave any property, it's, it's now going to be the buyer's property. Utilities connected, you want to make sure it's connected to a public water main and a public sewer main. So typically in the city, that's going to be the case, or that the septic tank is connected if it's out in the country and a well. Uh, insulation, new construction, that's self-explanatory. Um, and then homeowners association, if there is a homeowners association, you definitely want to check this because it gives them time to review the CCNRs, which could be 100 pages. You know, CCNRs might have, you know, no dogs, the fence has to be, you know, 3.2 feet high, you know, something really goofy. There's always goofy stuff in there. They can't fly an American flag. This guy might be a veteran. He's like, whoa, wait a second. I've seen the CCNRs. I can't fly an American flag on my own property. It's like, yeah, that's, that's what they're trying to do. <clears throat> there was a big case, a national to do about that in the Tri Cities a few years ago with a vet coming back from Iraq, and he wanted to fly his American flag. And the HOA, they said, no, you can't do that. So I went to court and got on to, got, I think, 60 minutes or something like that. And uh, definitely that HOA changed their mind because they got a real black eye in the press. Okay. <clears throat> and down here, home warranty and oh why did that not load excluded items in here you can type you know tractor and and lawnmower and uh, beautiful curtains or something like that so that's where you'd put excluded items and the home warranty didn't load up for some reason um, thank you know thank technology for that but that's where you would include a home warranty and who's going to pay for it the buyer or the seller sometimes it's the agent sometimes agents like to include a home warranty uh, when they are working with their clients typically four or five hundred dollars and you can always contact the home warranty people Kelly Quinn uh, in the state of Washington and I think she covers North Idaho at Fidelity uh, home warranties okay so I might just save all this stuff that we've been doing just to make sure that <clears throat> we don't lose it <clears throat> excuse me I'm a frog in my throat okay we saved all that now we're gonna go keep going down our forms make sure everything looks good Lead-based paint, again, a boilerplate, standard form, nothing too exciting here. Uh, certainly, Gordon doesn't remember any lead-based paint being used, and most people won't. You know, it's, it's lead-based paint, if it was used in 1940, uh, nobody knows about that. And it's got seven layers of latex paint over it. So 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, you're going to see this. Seller has no knowledge of lead-based paint. Seller has no reports of lead-based paint, okay? Um, the buyer can, you know, waive the opportunity to conduct a risk assessment or accept an opportunity to conduct a risk assessment. And that's fine. If they want to do that with their inspection addendum, great. This is where you would do that. Okay, so that form, pretty simple, filled out. Title contingency. Now, this, I like to, I like to keep this one in play because... Again, I see the problems. When we have 350 agents, we I see the problems. Most of you guys never will run into this, but inevitably every month there's a title issue, a cloud on title, and it comes to me, and I'm like, okay, well, let's solve this. Let's figure it out. But with my clients, I do like to make sure that they can get a title, a marketable title, and uh, so it's a real simple form. It's basically just saying if you can't get a marketable title, then we're out of the deal. Um, so that's a pretty simple form. Okay. Title contingency, dun, 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 inspection addendum.
Uh, can you use Paragon and Transaction Desk kind of toggle between the two, or does that make sense? I can. I mean, I can get into Paragon here. Why do I need to? When you have a sec. Yeah, somebody wants to see. Uh, let me look at the question. Da, da, da. How that all yeah. works. Okay. Switch oh, yeah, yeah, very simple. So just kind of watch. You got the tabs up here. Well, there's Paragon and there's Transaction Desk. Yeah. Right in between those. There you go. Okay. All right. I can go back to home. I can go residential um, back. There's the listing right there. So if I need to verify anything, I can just kind of yeah, toggle in between these or cut and paste. Okay, so inspection. We definitely want an inspection contingency. Neighborhood review contingency, maybe. I mean, you know, there might be some stadium lights or something that's um, pretty goofy out there. Waiver of inspection. This is where, let's say you're in uh, Seattle, an inspection contingency would really kind of hurt the offer. Now, we never want to suggest them to our clients to waive the inspection, but sometimes they might. That's, that's what we saw last night in this offer. They said, hey, we're going to waive the inspection. We just want to make sure that um, we want to make sure that this thing is, uh, that we get a good offer in. Sorry, I was getting a text. I, if you guys aren't aware, I've got about 10 things going on at once. So sometimes I'll look down or look over and uh, trying to handle lots of different things. So. Um, waiver of inspection, we don't want to do that unless you really, really have to. You know, sometimes the guy buying it might be flipping it. He's going to tear it apart anyway. He's a contractor. But at least if they do that, if they want to waive the inspection, they've checked this box and they've signed it. <clears throat> so that's really important. Um, a lot of times in Seattle and Portland, we're seeing pre-inspections now so that it doesn't, it doesn't take up anyone's time. It doesn't prohibit the seller from continuing to market their property. They just paid $500 for a pre-inspection, and that inspection report is available for all buyers. So um, be careful about what you mark on here, but typically you basically are just checking the inspection, and property may include an inspection of the sewer system, which I always recommend. That's where they just snake the system with a little camera on it. It goes all the way out to the street, and so you can see if grass or roots or, you know, a, a tile has collapsed or anything like that. So um, <clears throat> neighborhood review, you typically don't see that very often. Okay, let's go back to our forms. Inspection, agency disclosure. Uh, we'll go through it just because it's pretty simple. Basically just saying to, to all parties, buyer and seller, uh, I am representing both. So here is where I would say seller and buyer. Now get everyone's signature on here, including mine. Okay, so just make sure that there's dual agency. If you're not familiar with this, it can be a problem with the states. And that's why when, we, when you're doing a file and you're representing both the buyer and the seller, we create two separate files. So just like you would be you know, with another agent at another company, there has to be to the state of Washington, Idaho, Oregon, Florida, they all want two separate files. So, and we charge two separate fees. So in this deal, when these close, I would like to see two separate checks come in to me, and I'm gonna pay $179 out of each of those checks because we have to maintain separate files. They're duplicates mostly, but we have to maintain two separate files. So when we get audited and they see du dual agency, they're going to want to say, hey, let me see both files. And did you represent both parties evenly and equally? Um, because you can't divulge information from one to the other to give one an advantage over the other. You just can't do that. So it's really important that, uh, that with dual agency, everybody knows that you're representing both parties. And that's what this form is for. Okay. Then the law of real estate agency. Uh, it's just a pamphlet. <clears throat> Most of you guys have seen this. State of Washington requires that we deliver it to our uh, clients. So sometimes just saying, hey, you know, here you go. I've delivered it. Uh, a lot of agencies want this initial. Um, so it's probably a good habit to get this initial just anywhere up here. And that way they've initialed that they see what agency is. And if you don't, if you're not familiar with this, take the time to read it. 
Okay, this is something we want to give everybody. So, and here you'll see duties of dual agent prescribes the additional duties of a broker representing both parties in the same transaction and requires the written consent of both parties to the broker acting as a dual agent. Okay, so that agency form uh, sat satisfies that. <clears throat> and then, yeah, you can, you can read that. I won't get into it right now. Okay, so we've got our transaction forms. This was the missing piece uh, 30 minutes ago that I just, I, for some reason, I was having a brain fart. Um, that's a technical term, by the way, if you're not familiar with that. So, okay, now we've got this. I want to go in here. I'm going to save it. And our forms look pretty good. Um, let's see, transaction forms. Yep, we've got all those. Now, let's go to signing. <clears throat> Okay, open signing. <clears throat> now this isn't where we're supposed to be again. So I want to go back to our Alex Veselitz file. There's Alex Veselitz. And so you'd think you just click on the pen, but it doesn't always work that way. <clears throat> mm -mm -mm. Um, where are we? Let's try this. Delete, create, apply, archive. Go to details. Ah, empty. Add signing name, Alex Veselitz. Do that again. Go to new signing, save. There we go. <clears throat> this is what I believe I wanted. So we've got that. Now I can do Alex, remote signer, add. And I need to, this is a little bit goofy because it's like you click it on and you have to do it three or four times. There it is. Okay, so alexv at kellywright.com. <clears throat> He's the buyer. Save participants. Documents. Now our documents, there they finally are. So it is a little bit goofy. Remember, sometimes uh, these new technology platforms are wonky. Um, I don't like the symbols. Everything's a symbol, and I'd rather just have a lot of words. And especially in this one, you've got a lot of different pens around. So it does make it confusing as to if you push the pen, is that am I in the signing part of it? And so that's what I kind of went back and forth with. But this is Alex's offer, and we are going to add all of these forms. <coughs> Excuse me. T's not helping. Okay, so it's adding a whole bunch of documents to this thing. Okay, I'm going to close this. So all these little boxes are where they're all going to sign, except some of these back here, they don't have little signature sections. So we're going to design those here in a bit. Okay, <clears throat> so that all looks good. We've got purchase and sale. We've got financing. We have optional clauses. We have lead-based paint. We have title contingency inspection addendum agency disclosure, law of real estate agency, the seller disclosure, describing the property, was there ever a flood, uh, any pest infestations, um, any problems with the roof, any flooding, any leaking, all that kind of stuff. And then lead-based paint. So we've got all the forms that we need here. So let's go ahead and design. Preparing a 31-page document. And then, Alex, I'm going to send this to you. So uh, check your, make sure your email is up and running. And then when you get this, even though you're only 20 feet from me, let's pretend you're in uh, Barcelona drinking your sangria, getting ready for the Acapulco. nighttime bullfight okay. you're going to go to. Um, I wanted to say Acapulco. Oh, you want to do? Okay, you can be an Acapulco. You're a world traveler, so I mean Acapulco. You know what? Acapulco, Spain, whatever. I am. Okay, okay, so this is where we've got it designed, and it tries to automate it as best it can, So, you, but you also want to verify, 
because he's going to be signing there and doing a digital date there. Now, remember, you can always do this. You just print out these blank forms and go over. A lot of times, I mean, if it were my mom and dad, they would—they don't even have a computer. So I'd have to print these out, go over to their house, have some tea and cookies, and they're going to sit down at a table and sign each of these old school. But this is the way we do it digitally, and you can do it either way. A signed document is a signed document. Sure. It'll be on uh, YouTube later, too. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So it looks good there. Initials AV for Alex Veselitz. Uh, he pronounces Veselitz, but I like Veselitz. <laughs> Not like people know their own names. Um, sorry, Alex. <laughs> One of those defects, Don't my many name. defects in my brain. <laughs> Um, okay, financing contingency. Oh, one thing I missed in the financing, we wanted to make this a strong offer, so I didn't do loan cost provisions. Typically in an even market, if you bring a full price offer, you get you can usually ask for 3% of the purchase price for closing costs, but in this hot market we have right now, it's not it's not prudent to ask for closing costs. Closing costs can be paid for by the lender as well. So that's why we recommend everybody get pricing, loan pricing, and terms from us at K-Loans and go compare it. Take, take what we give you. Go out to brokers and banks and credit unions. But you want to, that's the only way you can ensure, number one, the best interest rate. And with that best interest rate comes the ability for the lender to pay closing costs. So in a hot market, you don't want to ask the seller to because the seller's got three other offers coming in. He's not going to pay closing costs. But you might not have the closing costs. And the an old school way of doing that is just, well, you need $5,000, bump the price up $5,000, and then the seller will give you that $5,000 back in this section, right, $5,000 or a percentage. So, but that's an important piece to this. When you're putting the offer together, talk to me or Louie or Brandon so that we can give you some pricing. I know right now that if I gave, if I offered somebody the same interest rate that Wells Fargo is offering today, 4.0% for a 30-year fix, we can do, with good credit, we can do a 3.5% 30-year fix. And so that half point, if I bump them up to 4%, the same as Wells Fargo's uh, offering today, I can go ahead and write 3% in there, and the lender's going to pay a full 3% to closing costs. Now, on a $300,000 purchase, you know, we're talking, this is going to be close to $10,000 which they're not going to need. They're going to need about $6,000 on this one. So I would probably put in 2% um, and so, so on and so forth. So it's a balancing act that we do to make sure that your a client gets the best interest rate, but also gets closing costs paid for if they need that. So it gets complicated, but trust me, the team at K-Loans will take care of you. And anything they do, you can compare it to a thousand different lenders across the country to make sure your client's getting the best deal. The only way to get the best deal is to shop. Okay, so financing addendum, optional clauses, everything looks good. We still see AV over here, initialed where you're supposed to. It's uh, oh, There's the part that was kind of blocked out. And so home warranty, here's where you would put in home warranty provider, fidelity, seller shall pay $500 towards, or it could be others, like buyer wants to pay $500 for a new policy or um, by seller selling agent, so the buyer's agent wants to contribute five hundred dollars to go towards a home warranty. So it can be in there, and then other <clears throat> you can mark that and put anything in there. That's where you could say, hey, uh, there's a boat on a trailer, and it's a lakefront property. Sale to include boat um, and trailer VIN numbers with a value of ten thousand dollars. And so that way you can also do a bill of sale and include it in the transaction. Sometimes farmers do that, you know, leave the tractor. No one wants to haul a tractor around. So, um, but you got to make sure you get the VIN number in there and a bill of sale. So it's not, the lender is not going, hey, wait a second, I'm not going to lend on a tractor. I'm only going to lend on the house itself. So you can separate them a little bit. And again, if you get into that situation, let me know and I'll walk you through it. Lead-based paint, kind of boilerplate. We've been through that. There's Alex's name, his initials. <clears throat> In this case, I would just, when I get all this stuff back, I'm just going to sign this part right here, listing broker and selling broker. 
title contingency, inspection, we're still seeing the AVs, AVs, AVs. Pretty soon we're not going to see those. Aha, here we're not seeing it. Okay, so now we need to design. So we've got Alex, and I'm going to do drag and drop, and I'm going to do Alex, sign here, and date here. If you need to do an initial, you can do that here. Okay, oops, there we go. Delete that, but a signature or an initial, and that's the little date thing there. You can also put X's in there. So if you missed an X, um, actually, what's a good example? Let's say neighborhood review. It's like, oh my gosh, we missed the neighborhood review. Okay, we want a neighborhood review. Then you can just put an X right there. Okay, so it's pretty easy. So once you get the feel of these transaction desks and form simplicity and, and all the different variations of this, DocuSign, I mean, it, it all works pretty slick. Um, and not to say it's not without flaws, but you can get around the flaws if you're patient. Um, and again, I'm going to sign that, just physically sign it, because I know it's all coming back to me, and I print it out for a file, and then I can just sign it there as well. Law of agency. Oh, yeah, we want Alex to initial that. So <clears throat> that way we're covered. We know that he got it. <clears throat> Seller disclosure. Now, Gordon, he signed this already. When I took the listing, um, actually, this is one that he signed a different one. But let's pretend he signed all this and he's got it all marked up, you know, yes and no and don't know and all that stuff. And seller's initials. So he, he the one that we have for him, actually, I'll show it to you right here. Whoops. This one's all marked up. No, wait, no, it's not. That's why. No, I got one in a file, so my apologies. I'm going to have to upload that when an offer comes in. Okay, so back to our transaction. So down here, let's assume Gordon has signed all this part, and then we want to get Alex's signature. There's the buyer. So Alex is going to sign here and date there. And this is just saying buyer hereby acknowledges that he's seen this, <clears throat> it doesn't constitute a waiver of rights. So do not let your buyer sign down here because they are waiving their rights. And uh, yeah, this is one we could X up. Seller has no known knowledge. The seller would have signed there, but the buyer also has to initial here and date it. So there's our Alex initials. And, um, and he also waived... The opportunity and so we got a sign Alex is going to sign here and also date here and initial here it's kind of redundant I know but it's just it's it's goofy okay so we've got this whole thing marked up and ready to go and it all looks good let's get up there bam so let's hit next <clears throat> All right, now I can do a custom invitation, or I could just send it. But in this case, we're going to do uh, your offer on Magnolia. And I could do, Alex, I know you are drinking a sangria in Aku, if I spelled this wrong, probably Acupulco. Acupulco. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Acupulco. That's not how you have to spell it. Acupulco. Does that sound right, everyone? No, probably not. Okay, but let's say I'm just bad at spelling. So Acupulco, um, hope you're having fun, having fun. Uh, great. Try the high dive uh, off the cliff. After you have had a few more drinks. Oh, BTW. Uh, digitally sign these forms, please. Joe. Actually, I hope spell check. Oh, thank you, spell check. Okay. So I've got this note to him. He knows it's coming. We've been on the phone. We've been texting, talking, whatever. So he's sitting there with his sangria, and he's waiting for this stuff to come over his phone. And now I send the invitations. Okay. 
Perfect. So this now is in the interweb, the cloud. Uh, hopefully there's not a storm in the cloud. Uh, and it's going to go down to him depending on how fast all the servers are and everything. So it's got to go through our routers, our servers, then to the, um, the, the ISP servers, then all the way down to whomever is handling Alex's phone, their servers, and all that. So Alex should be getting that shortly. Well, Alex, when you get that, why don't you go ahead and digitally sign those, <clears throat> and then I'll check my email, and uh, they should come back to me. So while he's doing that, let's keep going back through this. Let's make sure that everything looks good. It's in progress. So the signing has this little lightning bolt. It's like, okay, it's in progress. Fantastic. Um, ba -ba -ba. Let's say you forgot something, though. You could go, well, let's not do that. It's going to be too complicated for me. Um, everything looked pretty clean, and so he's got what he needs. Um, while we're waiting for him, Let's go back to Paragon. Oh, there are a couple of things I wanted to talk to about the offer as well. Um, let's get into our list. Any agenda escalations? Okay, let's get into a few different things here. Um, when you're sending an offer, you also want to make sure that when you send this offer, you've got a copy of the earnest money check. That's really important. And you've got a copy of that earnest money check, and you send that with the offer. It says, okay, $3,000, your name on it, and it's, um, and it's made out to First American Title. The, you want your client to hold on to that until the transaction's been signed around. Once that transaction's been signed around, go ahead and take that check and a copy of the purchase and sale down to the title company, down to First American, and give it to them and say, hey, I'm opening up escrow. Here's a copy of the PSA. Here's a copy of the, here's the check. And so um, you want to make sure that, that you give that to them and they'll give you a receipt. The earnest money receipt is really, really important. Okay? Get a copy of that, and that's part of what we need in our files to make it a complete file. Um, also, with that offer, you're going to get your prequal letter. So whether you use K-Loans or another lender, a bank, everyone does a prequal letter. They've, you know, of course, they've been prequalified because you wouldn't be making an offer unless they were prequalified. I'll kind of show you our prequal. Here's a couple pre-approval letter. So this was one I did yesterday for Frank O. Yes, Alex? Oh, I'm all signed, Joe. Sorry about oh, that. Okay, great. Thanks. So this is a <clears throat> this is a prequal up to one point six five one million dollars, and so they're putting thirty percent down. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, they didn't get the property, but this is something you also want to add with your offer. So you've got all that paperwork back. You've got a copy of the three thousand dollar earnest money check, and you've got the pre-approval letter showing that yes, they have made application and that they um, their credit's been pulled. Their debt to income ratios are good. The LTV is good. They qualify. And we are serious about making this offer. Okay, so and here at K Loans, we can do a pre-approval in just a few minutes. Okay, <clears throat> so let's get rid of that and go back to a transaction desk, and let's see if this sucker came in. I'm going to uh, refresh and see if it made its way back through the servers. It did. So we see that approved, and now instead of a lightning bolt, we see a little award. We won first prize. Alex, you get first prize for your 700-foot dive into the ocean with sharks. Well done. Okay, let's take a look at this sucker. <clears throat> okay, so now we see a little bit different stuff here. Authenticated and signed. We know it was signed. This is the legal authentication. So there's a form. Um, we can do the final document here. But if anyone says, you know, hey, that's not a legitimate form, if it ever went to court, that authentication is what we're looking for. <clears throat> okay. So we've got all this now. Look at those pretty signatures. Alex is buying. Hey, Alex, you didn't know this, but you just bought a house. So good luck, sucker. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm out of here. 
So anyway, you see the initials and all of this stuff in here, financing addendum, fantastic. Well done, sir. And he can do that with his, his smartphone. So as he's getting prepared for his high dive into the shark-infested waters in Acapulco, he just signed a contract to buy this house. And we're in fantastic shape. Now, let's say he sent, I'm in already sent me a check for $3,000. I'm, I'm holding on to it, so that's good, which I'd want to do if he's going on vacation like this. If he's leaving the country, it's like, look, we're going to be making an offer. Why don't you make out a check? And you, he could even keep the check, but he'd have to overnight it to me or wire it in the next day if this is accepted. So better I hang on to it. Um, you have to be very careful. The state gets really, really leery about us holding the public's money. That's why the earnest money receipt is so important. When you go into the title company and you're dropping everything off, get rid of that earnest money. Because the longer we hold on to it, if we violate rules or laws, they can come slap us on the wrist, and if we're habitual about it, they can take our license away. So we don't want to do that. And they're certainly going to beat me over the head with a raw salmon, and I don't want that to happen. So we just really have to be cognizant about that earnest money receipt and getting that in. But if Alex is in Acapulco, before he left, he gave me a check. I've got it in the file. And once this is all signed around and accepted, then I'm going to go ahead and bring that into the title company. Okay, so you can see everything is, and you want to double check everything. Okay, it's initialed, 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 initialed. We'll just assume everything's initialed right. And um, I think when it's sent to him, there's an initial or sign all button. And basically, it all gets signed and sent right back to us immediately. So, and again, with servers and the cloud and everything, hey, Acapulco, Barcelona, Beijing, it doesn't matter. It can happen instantaneously. Now, um, we can upload this or view it as a PDF and save it that way. So let's say, for example, and this is what I'm going to have to do with Dr. Moore. He's 90 years old. I'm going to have to save it as a PDF, and then I'm going to print it. So I'll print it here on the company printer, the Konica Minolta, and then I'm going to take it uh, over to his house, and I'm going to get it signed there if he agrees to it. Now, he might say, Okay, this offer is fine, but there's multiple offers, and I'm not sure I want to accept that. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel that. We've saved it. I've got it in here. I can email it to him as, as well this way. Um, I had a client do this last week. We sent an offer in, and he didn't want to digitally sign it. He's like, just email it to me, and I'll print it out, and I'll sign it. And I think he just wanted it for his records or liked putting pen to paper. You know, so people are different. They might be really comfortable with e-signatures. They might be totally uncomfortable with e-signatures. And you just have to kind of take their lead. And uh, so with this one with Dr. Moore, I'm going to have to go ahead and print all this out and bring it to him. Uh, but I can, if I want, I can just go ahead and have him e-sign it now too. So we can be in here and I can upload this <clears throat> to Dropbox. I can send it that way. Now, he certainly wouldn't know what to do with that. but. So you can upload it or just save it as a PDF. Let's close this. So there's that document. Here's all the individual forms that are signed. If you just want to print out one. And the original document will show them not signed. So if you're like, oops, we made a mistake, you know, let's go back to the original document and change a couple things. And, uh, and then we can get it e-signed again. So look, no signatures in any spaces here. So that's the original document. So all of that's right here. Document for Alex, final document, authentication, and it shows that it's signed. Okay. Fantastic. And all this, you can resend, you can certificate, you can upload to the cloud, uh, you can copy it. So the certificate is pretty simple. Just says, you know, officially this has been signed. There it is. Signing certificate shows the time, shows delivery, final document, and all that. So again, that's if it ever gets if it ever gets to a court or anything like that. This is an official signature, and so we're in the midst of you know great change in technology with all this, and being able to do it on a smartphone or a laptop anywhere in the world really changes things. But I'm sure there's lots of court cases already where people are like, well, I didn't read it. And I just hit a button, and I didn't know, but I still want to sue. 
Well, and the court's going to look at that and go, well, look, here's an authentication that you did sign it. You have to be responsible for your signatures, and you hopefully read it. So um, anyway, that is that part of it. So let's go back, and I've been kind of really huffing and puffing here for a while. See if there's any other questions out there. If clients physically sign, do the signed documents then scanned back into Transaction Desk? Yes. So that's a good question, Lynn. You can do that. So what we had here, you just want to save it as a PDF. Um, final document. Okay, so just it's like any sort of PDF. Um, if we do this, so let's see, view as a PDF. And if I, I'd have to, I have to save it. So save as PDF on my desktop. Desktop, Alex, boom. Okay. So now it is right here. And I can take this and I can go ahead and physically sign that. So I don't want to do it right now, but let's say I just open this up and I scribble on my signature. <clears throat> um, actually, I'm, I think I can do that with some of this stuff. Pen right here, maybe? No? Okay. Oh, wait. Bingo. Pen. Validate. Uh, mm, for some reason it's locked. Okay, but let's say I printed this out and I physically signed it. And then I scanned it back into the computer. So now I've got it back here as this PDF. If I go back into, da, 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 close that, into our Alex Vesselitz file. Okay, we've got all this stuff in here, Vesselitz. I have to go to details. Let's see, add, delete transaction. No, don't want to do that. Let me get rid of this here. History, I want to add forms. So let's go back here. Sell it. Forms. Add. Oh, that's state. So I'm going to get there. It's always a confusing section. So let's see if we do, nope. Add, 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 select all. Forms, <clears throat> back to home. I know it's in there. Agency, oh, here we go. This is what I wanted. Lead base paint, go to documents. Add. Create new instant effects. No, create new. Oh, come on, people. Transaction folder. That's not what I want. Okay. It's funny because I just did this the other day. Okay, we have vessel vesselets, and we want to add, because normally there's a box down here, and I don't, again, technology is like one day it works, and then the next it doesn't. Upload? No, that's not how we do it. So I'm going to go back to here. So let's tasks, signings, dashboard, details, got all that, contacts, documents, loading. Let's see if we can add from here. Add new document. Ah, there we go. See, as you guys can see, it is kind of confusing. You have to, you know, you're adding this, and it doesn't bring up the right uh, box. And it's it's a little bit, like I say, wonky. It's clunky. There's there's some goofy things to, these are all technical terms, by the way, uh, goofy things to this sucker. But, okay, so now I can take this form and put it in here. 
It's just a PDF. Again, just think of me as having signed it and scanned it. And now I've got a PDF in here. Boom. There. So I can upload that and I can digitally sign this or print it and sign it here. So again, adding, adding a PDF from your desktop or wherever you keep your PDFs and bringing it in, importing it into this transaction can be done. And that was probably the longest answer I could have had for you, Lynn, so my apologies. Okay, any other questions? Okay, good. So let's get back in here. We're going to go through some statewide forms. I'm going to take a sip of tea and kind of take a deep breath. We're mostly through this. Again, making an offer is it can be complicated. And so one of the complications is, yes, it's a hot seller's market, and there's multiple offers. So you got to be really careful on that. A lot of times it'll say, send your final and best, your highest and best offer by you know Monday, and we're going to review with, uh, with client Monday at 5 p.m. And that's typically where I, if I'm the listing agent, I'm like, okay, let's do this. We've got three offers coming in. I print them up set them on the table, look at which one's best, and let them decide. And it's not always the highest amount. It could be a cash offer, which is the case with Frank's offer yesterday. They probably accepted a lower offer, but it was cash. So he's willing to offer $1.6 million. Someone probably came in and said, I'll do $1.5 million, $75,000. So $25,000 less than Frank's offer, but it's cash. And as we all know, cash is king. Lending can be a problem. Appraisals can come in low. So they probably thought, you know what, this is going to be good. In a week, a week from now, when all the paperwork's done, we're going to have 1.5 million, 75,000. So it's not always the highest offer. It is. It is uh, most usually it is. I mean, most people want more money for their property, but not always. So don't make that assumption. Okay, let's go to forms. Here we are. Statewide forms. And let's go to the escalation clause. I do want to touch base on escalation clauses. There we go. Escalation addendum. Okay. So this is blank right now, but you know, if we want to add this, we would add it to our transaction data today between uh, buyer Alex and seller Gordon concerning the address that we're making an offer on. And, okay, so the purchase price. If seller receives a competing offer for the property prior to accepting this offer with a net price equal to or greater than the net price of this offer, then the net price of this offer shall be increased. Okay. So this is where you put in the increments. So there's two sections that are really important to this. The increment is how much higher than a competing offer are you willing to go? And then you want to have a cap on it. You know, you can't just leave it uncapped because, you know, very few of us would qualify, certainly not me, would qualify for a you know, $2 million purchase. Um, so let's say we're at the 329 okay? But we know three other offers are coming in, and we really, really want this house. And we're like, you know what? These other offers are coming in. We've got to go higher, but how much higher are we willing to go? You want to take your first clue from your lender. So your lender is the one that's going to say, hey, look, you can only go up to 340. I pre-qualified you. Your debt to income is not going to change unless we do something dramatic to your debt part of it. The income can change. Let's say you're, you know, you're a nurse at the hospital and you make $5,000 a month. That's it. You can't just go, hey, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to make $6,000 a month. So um, your income stays the same. But what could happen is you're like, okay, well, 
I make five thousand a month. My debt to income only I can only afford a three hundred and forty thousand dollar purchase. But I also have these two credit cards with a hundred dollar a month payment, and I've got a student loan outstanding that is you know three thousand dollars left with a hundred dollar a month payment. So grandma says, okay, you know what? Um, I want to see you buy this house. And she's like, I'm going to gift you $10,000. So you go and you pay off the credit cards. You go pay off the student loan. And you just saved $300 a month, which means your debt to income ratio can go up significantly. Okay? So that's how we can change the debt side of the equation, but we can't change the income side. So you take your cues from the lender. They go, you know what? You can only go up to 340. You're like, okay. Then 340 it is. But the increments I want to be significant. If you put in here, can you imagine if you just put in like $10? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm gonna do $10 more than a competing price. Nobody cares. I mean, they might they might just take the other offer. I probably would. I'd take the offer, other offer, just because you've kind of insulted me here. So and it would be the same with a hundred dollars. Um, I know on Frank's deal, he uh, it was like $5,000 increments. But again, that's Seattle. Seattle and Portland are going to see higher prices. Uh, Lakefront, of course, in North Idaho is going to see higher prices. But Spokane and the Tri-Cities, other parts of Oregon, uh, Alabama, you're not going to see these kind of high prices. So uh, certain parts of Florida, certainly you can see the high prices. But yeah, I think a good increment for me is $1,000. It means you're serious. You're like, look, if you get an offer for three thirty-three, dollars I'll go up to three thirty-four, dollars And that's a significant enough amount. And again, it's just it's a balancing act. You balance art and science here. How much do you really want this house? I mean, if you just really, really, really want it, it's, you know, where you're going to raise all your kids and this is your final house and it's beautiful and it fits and you have to have that neighborhood, then I wouldn't screw around. I would advise my client, look, you really, really want this house. Let's not take a chance. Let's do $2,000. Because $1,000 to some people is just not that big a deal. They might be like, you know what? I, I'm a, I like these other people better. Um, I just think they're friendlier. They're going to fit better in this house. So I'm just going to take their lower offer because $1,000 increment is not that much. $2,000, now we're starting to really talk here. This is this is a significant amount of money. So three up to three forty dollars and a $2,000 increment. Okay? Let's see how we're doing on questions. Nope. Okay. So what this means is that now when they get these offers in, so they're reviewing them Monday at 5 o'clock, and they get three offers in, and one is just straight up for 329 probably not going to win. Yours is at, now Alex's, we'll say, is at 340 He's going up to $340,000. That's as high as he can go. But he's going to go, he starts with an offer of three twenty nine, dollars and $2,000 increments will continue to go up. So right now, he's basically at three thirty one. dollars So this offer of straight up three twenty nine, dollars Alex is escalating, so he's at three thirty one. dollars But voila, we've got another offer over here. They started at three twenty eight, dollars but they will, they'll go up in $2,000 increments up to three thirty three. dollars Okay, so now they're the highest offer at 333, but they capped out at 333. We're capped out at 340, but we're in $2,000 increments, so now we're at 335. Does that make sense? And again, you can always email me an escalation clause, and, and as you're going through this, if you've never done one before, let me know and I'll walk you through it and help you with it. But so the competing offer is 333. We're going two thousand dollar increments all the way up to three forty, but that doesn't mean we just reach three forty. It just means that we're now at three thirty five, and that's where it stands. We looked at all the offers on the table. Three thirty five, voila, sold to Alex Vasellitz, high diver, cliff jumper, sangria drinker, world traveler. He's got his house on Magnolia. Fantastic. He is going to raise 20 kids there, teach them all to dive off cliffs. Okay, <laughs> sorry, Alex. The story gets a little wilder as we go on, but uh, you know, hey, we all need a little entertainment. Um, okay, so now Alex gets the house, and 
a couple questions can arise with this. A lot of people, there's a little bit of paranoia out there, and, and for good reason, I get it, because they're saying, okay, you've got to basically now produce a bona fide offer, okay? And that's where it says bona fide arm's length. And what that means is, you know, it has to be a legitimate offer, and it can't be Uncle Fred. So that's where the fraud would come in. So, and, and it's hard to determine because, you know, Uncle Fred could possibly be arm's length. It's not a brother or sister. But let's say Uncle Fred's like, hey, you know what? Wink, wink. Let's drive this price up. This guy's at 340. I'll tell you what, I'll make an offer at 338. And then this guy will, you know, it'll, it'll jump up to 340. And that way you make 7,000 more dollars than this three, or I'm sorry, 5,000 more dollars than this 335. So I'm sure it's probably been done in, in, in real estate. Fraud is, every bit of fraud has been done. Um, and so that probably has happened in the past. So you just gotta, you gotta do some due diligence. And what I would do is say, okay, we've got a competing offer. It's gotta be bona fide. It's gotta be arm's length, meaning not family, not someone closely tied to the party. It's gotta be an arm's length transaction. And then it's gotta be on the same forms as the, as the Northwest MLS forms, at least this case in Washington. And they're going to give you a copy of that offer. <clears throat> and that's where I would say, okay, I'm going to give a call to this agent and say, I'm sorry, you know, we got the house, but did you guys really make an offer of, of 333 or in this case, 338? And they might get caught. They could get busted at that point. The real estate agent is going to lose his license, number one. Um, there's going to be a pretty big to-do with both the MLS and the state because this is fraud. So you do get, your client does get a copy of the best competing offer. It should be bona fide legitimate. You see on there that it's 330, escalated to 333, and you clearly escalated higher than that. So you're at 335, and that's where you start filling this in. So purchase price of competing offer and less credits to buyer. There were no credits, let's say. Let's keep it really um, clean. And plus escalation amount of uh, escalation amount 335. Whoops, I'm sorry, wait, 333, and this should be 2000. Whoops, competing offer, less credits, well, maybe they want zero in there. Competing offer, net purchase price, Huh, I wonder why it's not applicable. You can write that in. And so that's what it should be is 333 plus escalation amount and the new purchase price, $2,000, should be 335. Okay, I'll have to figure out why it's doing that. Um, but there's a lot of times this is just handwritten in here. But the, this is the most important section. New purchase price shall be 335. Okay. So that's where that stuff is done. Then they initial this. Everybody signs and initials it, and you've got the competing price, uh, 335. Seller's happy. It escalated from 329 to 335, and you know, the buyer's probably happy because they got the house. Again, if they're in an escalation situation, they want that house. Okay, so any questions on escalation clauses with these offers? The chat room is quiet. It says no, 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 no. Okay, so that's the escalation side of it. Let me get rid of some of this junk I've got here. Let's get our fuse training agenda. Selling, escalations. I didn't go over condos, multifamily, land, or commercial because that's pretty self-explanatory. Your offer when you're doing it, no, actually, let me step back and do that real quickly. Um, you can add those forms at any time, and they're, they're pretty much the same. There's just a small variation. Statewide forms. Okay. Whoops. Let's go back. Uh, we'll just add. Create new standalone form.
Oh, a new computer is coming. I actually looked at one today. <clears throat> Let's go back here. You already ordered one? Or are you looking at one? No, I'm just trying to get the forms up, the statewide forms. I I um I had a itchy trigger finger. So okay, now let's go into the the selling, let's see, selling paperwork for purchase and sale. Okay, so here's a good example. Multifamily purchase and sale agreement. And again, pretty much the same, but this is a one to four unit. Let's say it's a duplex or a fourplex. <clears throat> this is where you'd use this form instead of the, the other purchase and sale. And the only, there's really almost no difference. Um, so the same stuff here, purchase price included, all this stuff, property data. So here's the legal description, the address, and then um, the tax parcel numbers. Okay, so that's a difference there. <clears throat> and then some of the verbiage here about um, each unit, okay? So, but primarily it's the same form. So if you have a duplex, use this. Um, if there are different parcel numbers, sometimes when you get multifamily, so a duplex may, well, they may have a, um, a house on one parcel and they divided it and they've got a small back house on the next parcel. That's where you'd put this stuff in there. So again, you can see it's almost it's almost um, negligible. Did you see Brian's question? Yeah, no, I saw Brian's question. Let's see. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. What are your thoughts on seller countering to an amount that is higher than the second highest offer? Um, oh, countering. You, you can do that. Um, it gets pretty complicated. I mean, I know uh, I've seen it happen before where a seller's like, hey, I got competing offers coming in and I'm going to counter on all of them. It gets it gets pretty goofy. Um, I would I, well, I would take a look at it. So number one, to answer your question, Brian, you can do that. I just think it becomes too confusing. And sometimes as a uh, a listing agent with the seller, the seller's like, look, I don't want to go back and forth. I just want you to bring my your highest and best, and I'm going to look at all of them at the same time. But certainly you can go back to them. There's nothing illegal about saying, hey, I'm going to counter this. And and even though you could do your, your, your pre-approval said 340, we're going to counter at 350. Well, they might be able to find a little more money, a little bit more room in their debt to income. You know, something might be there. So I think it becomes very, very confusing to counter in these multi-offer situations with escalations, but you can, you can. I mean, our fiduciary responsibility to our clients is so important. I mean, that's what the state wants us to do. That's why we have a license because we're, we're supposed to get the most money for them. Um, so you're just gonna have to take that one into consideration. Um, I just, I don't like it because it does become confusing and, and it is pushing the envelope a little bit, but nothing says you can't counter. Um, but, but, but still lower than the escalated top amount. Oh, you know, that's fine too. Uh, get a Mac, you'll never go back. Yeah, you know what, Lynn? I actually got a Mac. My wife and I got one at our house at home, and I use my PC all the time. I'm Mac. Once I, Mac love, I love my Mac. Once Mac, you do go back. Uh, it's just, no, no. Okay, so let's keep moving along on our agenda. And again, thank you everyone for your questions. I appreciate that. Um, let's see where we are. So multifamily condos, basically it's just a condo number and what's the HOA amount. Land is just a parcel number and commercial gets a little bit trickier. There's special commercial forms out there with the Commercial Brokers Association. We are a member of that. You guys are licensed to do real estate. So you can sell the Space Needle. And a lot of people are like, well, I'm not a commercial agent. Well, no one is. No one's, I mean, they might specialize in commercial properties, but everyone has the same licensing with the state of Washington, Idaho, Oregon, Florida, Alabama. So in Seattle, if you, you know, if someone says, hey, will you sell the Space Needle for me? You can legally do that. 
probably going to get a little bit complicated. So please give me a call if that does happen. But, but we do have a commercial division. I've done lots of commercial. I prefer commercial. Um, and there are commercial forms. And you can join the CBA. Uh, the Northwest MLS has some basic commercial forms that you have access to. But uh, Spokane, Tri-Cities, Portland doesn't have that. Um, and the, the CBA does cover Idaho, Oregon, Washington, California, and a couple other pockets here and there. Um, the forms probably could be used in Alabama and the southeast as we expand down there. But, um, you know, again, if you have a big commercial deal, call me and let's figure it out. Okay, so we've added different addenda escalations. We've covered that. Um, using financing to your advantage. So, and as most of you know, this is my specialty. So, using financing to your advantage. Now, we talked a little bit about those closing costs. And again, take your cue from the lender. If your lender is saying, hey, you can't go more than 340, okay, the lender will also know that okay, you've only got down payment. So let me get my calculator. Um, we're at a purchase price of 335 for Alex, and he only has 3% down. He has $10,000 dollars $10,050. He's been saving up for years for this. He's been nickel and diming, putting money in a piggy jar, pretty, pretty fat piggy jar if he's got this much, but this is all he has. So, he doesn't have money for closing costs. Closing costs are going to be $6,000 on this transaction. And it's like, oh, what do we do? Well, you can ask the seller for the closing costs in that financing addendum. We went over that. Or you can have the lender pay those closing costs. Okay? And he, he certainly can't pay it. So those are really our, our two curtains that we're going to choose from. Uh, curtain number three, if they've got a lot of money, let's say they're going to put 20% down. I would say, well, put 15% down and take the rest of your cash for closing costs and for new furniture or pay off some other debt and stuff like that. If they say to me, well, I don't want to pay mortgage insurance, I would say, you don't have to. The lender will pay your mortgage insurance and you'll still get a better rate than Wells Fargo or these big banks are quoting you. So it's very possible, and I'll show you this real quickly. Um, and, and again, we go into different wholesale lenders. This one's pretty easy because, well, it's called Ease. Let's let it load. There's a lot of information. So you can do 1% down. That is a program. And price my loan. So let's look at United Wholesale's rates this morning. They're pretty darn good. Okay. Conventional rates. This is their elite pricing, meaning 700, uh, 740 credit score or above and 20% down. So if they are doing 20% down, this is the pricing they would get. Now, Alex's credit, and let's say it's not quite 740, I'm sure it's 739 or somewhere close to that. So this is regular conforming 30-year fixed. And this negative, lowest negative number on a 30-day lock is what we're looking for. And that's still 3.5% interest rate. So even with a 680 credit score and just you know not a perfect situation, we can still put someone into a 30-year fixed loan at 3.5% today. I know Wells Fargo's at four. And if we do 4%, so if I went to if I went to my client and they're making this offer, I'd say, well, you know what, let's get the lender to pay your closing costs. And you're, you're expecting Wells Fargo. You know, they quoted you and you were okay with 4%. Well, guess what? We only need two percentage points on this $335,000 offer to pay for your closing costs. And right there is two percentage points. So at 335, 1.95% is $6,532. So I say, you know what, let's get the lender to pay your closing costs and your interest rate is going to be an eighth of a point better still than Wells Fargo or Bank of America or Quicken Loans. What's funny is we're actually, we're a wholesale uh, partner with Quicken Loans on their wholesale division. So, you know, we can get this kind of pricing and go through Quicken Loans, but if you go on their website or you go to a retail outlet, their interest rates at 4% as well. So. Um, you can always get a better interest rate on the wholesale side. 
But that's why, again, you take your cues from the lender because there's some magic in there. And it's not witchcraft. It is magic. And we're always honest and, and forthright with our clients. And I'll show them this stuff. I'll show them these, these rate sheets and say, look, there's your closing costs and that highlighted number right there. And that's the interest rate you would get. So they get a better, a little bit better payment and their closing costs are taken care of. Um, so again, take your cue from the lender and we, we play good in the sandbox. So if you're like, look, you know, my clients insist they want to go through Wells Fargo, like fine. Okay. But here's what their options are going to be. And they're not going to get this option. It's going to be limited at a bank. Another mortgage broker could do it, but they're very reluctant to because we're basically taking the profit out of their deal. So we're the most transparent, open lending company in America. So again, compare what we have and go out there and shop it for a couple days and then make a decision. Okay, so that's lending in a nutshell. And that's why you can use finance to your advantage. Um, you can also just get a straight up better interest rate, which is a lower payment, or you can get more purchase power. So if you have a lower interest rate, for example, if you can actually get a 3.5% interest rate, well, guess what? Instead of 340, we might be able to bring your maximum limit up to 348 or 350 for the same payment. We did this in Seattle a while back, and uh, it was our interest rate and Wells Fargo, conveniently. And <clears throat> they were limited to a $1,722 a month payment, and it was a $350,000 purchase down in Renton or Auburn, somewhere south sound. And we were able to bump them up to 371 for the same 1722 a month payment. Okay. So we, we they were the exact same payment, but they got $21,000 more purchase power because of the better interest rate. So interest rates translate into more purchase power, uh, reduced or eliminated closing costs, and a stronger offer or a lower payment. If they just were like, look, we have plenty of money. We just want the lowest interest rate for 30 years. So we you know have an extra $200 a month in our pocket. So that's the magic of good financing. Okay, let's take a look at our agenda. It's 12.02, we've done okay. Timelines, okay, let's get into timelines a little bit. So timelines are, uh, it's important to understand the timelines. And again, most of the cues you're gonna be taking are going to be from uh, they're going to be from the lender, okay? Uh, let's see, Brian has another question. Example is if an escalation on top offer is up to 500K, but the competing highest offer is 450K, do you think it's bad practice to counter to say 470K or more? I don't think it's bad practice. We're seeing more of that, Brian. Um, again, it just it can become very confusing, so you want to make sure that your seller knows what they're doing. If you're going to counter offer on these, make sure that that you really you know you really know what you're doing. And I get it. Bump that price up. We have a fiduciary responsibility to our client, so a counter offer is fine. But um, it's a very emotional time. I mean, people really really want these houses, and they don't get it. They're disappointed. They're upset. They're angry. They're sad. Crying, screaming. Um, you know, punching punching bags. Hopefully not people. So it's a very emotional time. And uh, I just try to be fair with everyone and just say, let's really get the highest and best. And But if your client's like, hey, look, we're going to counter offer because I want more money, then you do what they say. As long as it's legal and as long as it's ethical. That's our, that's our key guideline to everything. Okay, so timelines, you know, we go into this process where, you know, we've been working with a client and, you know, certainly... You spend a lot of time with a buyer driving around. You might have looked at 30 properties over a month. You know, every Saturday you've taken up a bunch of time and you're not getting paid for it. And I have incredible empathy for all of you that are, you're doing this incredible job and not getting paid. And sometimes people just walk away. They're like, oh, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to buy a house anymore. It's like, wait a second. I just spent every Saturday for the last month with you looking at houses. And now you're just going to walk away. And I'm not as gentle as some when they walk away. I really want to make sure it's like, hey, do you realize what you're doing? 
And but they, that that groundwork should have been done up front. It's like, look, I work on commission based only. I don't get paid an hourly to drive around for eight hours on a Saturday. No one's going to hand me a check until this deal closes. Now I'm happy to do it. That's what my job is. But understand how I get paid, and make sure you set that groundwork up front. And even when you say that, there's still people who use and abuse real estate agents, and they're not my friend. But most people don't. Most people are like, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Let's go find a house. I genuinely want to buy one. So you spend all this time with them, and then you pull the trigger, and you do that offer that we just went through. And that, you know, that typically takes a few hours, but it's an exciting time. It's like, hey, look, I'm going to go back to the office. A lot of times I'll say, well, you know, we've been looking at this. You want to make an offer on this property. Why don't you let me go back to the office and put this together or back to my house, and I'll meet up with you in a couple hours and we'll go over it. So you can prepare all the paperwork slowly, make sure that there's no mistakes, read over it carefully, and then either uh, print it or do the digital signature that we just went through, and uh, and then meet up with them again. Sometimes uh, before digital signatures, I would say, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and go back to the office, I'll print everything up, and then why don't you meet me back there in two hours to sign everything. And then uh, you'd have, you know, I'd have the, the paperwork there and a couple of pens and water and coffee and whatever. So um, then they sign it, and the timeline from there, once they sign it, the wheels really get set in motion, if the, as long as the, the seller's accepted it. So that last date on there, the seller accepting it, or any addendum that follows that, that last date is what we go off of. That's the starting point. That's, that's when we, we call it on the clock. So in the lending part of it, we're like, hey, we're on the clock. Let's get going. We got a purchase and sale. We're ready to rock and roll. And a lot of things get set in motion at that time. The, the lender is pretty much taking over the transaction, but there's still stuff we have to do as real estate professionals. And primarily we have to order the inspection. So we're going to deal with them, make sure that we go next day, we go down to uh, escrow, drop off that earnest money check, drop off a copy of the purchase and sale and religiously get an earnest money receipt. Cause that's what every state looks for first, get that earnest money receipt, and uh, send that to us and we create a file with all that paperwork. And then order the inspection. Say, okay, you know, Mr. Inspector, I got this guy, this friend of mine, you know, Nate Gooby is one of our agents. He's also an inspector, but say, Nate, I've got this house over here on, uh, on Magnolia. How soon could you get out and do an inspection? He's like, oh, I'm going on vacation. I'm going to go uh, jump off cliffs in Acapulco with uh, this crazy man, Alex. So I'm not going to be around for two weeks. It's like, oh, well, thanks. Uh, I'll call you when you get back, and uh, I'm going to move on to another inspector. You call up another guy you might have worked with. He's like, hey, I can do this tomorrow. Great. We love that. Thank you. What's your fee? $800. Whoa, that's too much. Call up the third guy. He's like, I can do it in two days, and that's $350. Okay, reasonable, fair, great. So your job is to get that inspection ordered, and, and, and you have to be out there for that inspection. Um, unless they're a licensed agent, like Nate, he's a licensed real estate agent. He lets himself in the house. He can be out there by himself. But if they're not licensed, then you have to typically go meet them out there, and the client will pay them, write a check for $350, and they'll poke around for a couple hours. And the inspection is the eye, the inspector is the, are the eyes and ears of the client. Remember, the appraiser, they're the eyes and ears of the lender. Okay, protecting the lender's investment, not the client's. So two different things. So your job is really to take care of that inspection, get all that all done, and then um, let the lender do their thing. So the lender's going to go ahead and get the loan application. They're going to go ahead and get all these documents in, bank statements, tax returns, pay stubs, social security card, copy of ID, um, all, just everything we need it could be investment statements if they've got twenty thousand dollars or for example if they're putting two hundred thousand dollars down I would say where's the two hundred thousand dollars so I'd want to see proof of funds send me an investment statement you've got an Ameriprise statement that says oh I got three hundred fifty thousand dollars in a money market I can liquidate at any time wouldn't that be nice um, so there's there's ways that you want to prove that that uh, you've got the funds to deliver and you're going to succeed in this purchase. But so they, the lender's really going to take this stuff. They're going to make application. They're going to get it into the underwriter, get the loan set up with them, get that part of it set. And I personally like to see the inspection come back first before an appraisal is ordered. 
okay? Because if the inspection comes back, and let's take, oh my God, there's mold all over this place. The roof is going to collapse. This thing is a hazard. It's an awful purchase. You don't want to pay another five or six hundred dollars for an appraisal if you're not going to buy it, if you're not going to proceed forward because the inspection came in so negative. Um, so wait till that inspection part's taken care of, but at the same time, the loan is set up with the lender and then literally it's almost simultaneous it's like okay if the loan is set up the inspection got uh, taken care of they you know they sent us a response form fix the gutters we agreed we'll fix the gutters inspection clause has been satisfied we're moving forward boom phone call to the lender hey go ahead and order the appraisal and lock this sucker we're, we're going to move forward Okay, so the appraisal can take anywhere from a week to six weeks. And again, those are the horror stories out of the Portland area with VA appraisers. If you don't know, it takes about 2,500 hours to become an appraiser. And then to be a VA or FHA appraiser, you have to have additional certifications. But 2,500 hours, that's, that's like two years of full-time study. I mean, the, the Dodd-Frank bill made it so hard to become an appraiser that there are very few of them. So that's why sometimes you see these yeah, long delays in the, this is the real estate broker you spoke with earlier. I was trying to catch you on your uh, your lunch. Um, are you talking to me, Alex? Oh no, sorry. I was I was I uh, got a call here. Okay. I didn't realize I wasn't. Yeah, you are not muted now. Um, okay, so appraisers um, they go out there and they do their thing. During that time, the underwriters asking the borrower for, hey, you know, you gave me two bank statements, but they were from November of last year. And one of the biggest frustrations we have are kind of obstinate or lazy borrowers. A lot of times we'll say, well, we need your two latest bank statements. They give us ones from November. And believe me, this is crazy. They'll do this. They'll say, well, I'm not going to give you a new one. I, I gave you what you need. And what they don't realize is that it's like, look, we're not, we're not making this up. If you don't get us what the underwriter is asking for, this deal's dead. You're not getting lending. And it's it's a crazy human emotion gets in the way too much. And a lot of people will say, hey, I bought a house 10 years ago. It wasn't like this. It was so much easier. It's like, you're right. I loved it 10 years ago. But we are handcuffed by over-regulations and laws that are just jammed down our throats uh, with the Dodd-Frank bill. Lending's hard. It's really hard, and, and it's, there's a set pattern that has to happen. And if people aren't patient and they're not willing to really give us everything we need, it doesn't matter whether it's K-loans or not. It could be, you know, Umqua Bank. It could be Wells Fargo. The loan's not happening if they're not cooperative. And so it's really, it's really important to set those expectations because, you know, of course, they come back and they're like, well, that lender is really tough to work with. They keep asking for more stuff. And then you as a real estate professional, you don't want to go, oh, yeah, this, it should be a whole lot easier than that. Uh, you don't know the circumstances. So be very careful about how you proceed to answer some of those questions. Um, not knowing the circumstances, we had one of these just a couple days ago. The borrower waited two weeks to get us paperwork that we needed to submit the loan to underwriting. So two weeks got wasted. Now at the end of it, they're, you know, everyone's asking for extensions and the seller's mad and everyone's mad and they just don't realize that it clearly was the buyer's fault. Uh, nobody's in the business of not doing loans or not doing real estate. We all want to close this because that's where we get paid. So just remember that, be patient and understand underwriters and uh, loan officers and loan reps. I mean, everybody in the process, their hands are really tied by incredible regulations. And I don't want to go too far into regulations, but trust me, there's a ton of them. We can't say the wrong word. We can't even blink wrong in the lending world or we'll go to jail. So um, that's all part of this fabulous Dodd-Frank bill. Okay, so timelines, you got the appraiser, he's done his job, the appraisal comes back, and again, we talked about this a little bit, it could come back low. If it does come back low, use that form that's a notice of low appraisal, let the other agent know on the selling side, hey, I'm sorry, on the listing side, this appraisal came back low, there's a notice of low appraisal, uh, Alex is buying this for 335 but the appraisal came in at 330 are you willing to go back down to 330 and the seller says, no, I'm not going 330. Can Alex make it up with cash? Well, no, Alex cannot make the difference up with cash. Um, 
And this is a good segue into the strongest offers that we're seeing in Seattle and these really hot markets. Um, again, we'll use the example from last night. This buyer was willing to go $200,000 difference to make up for a low appraisal. So if the appraisal came in at, at 1.4 million and he's, he's willing to give them 200,000 cash so that the seller gets their 1.6 million. That's a pretty extreme number. But sometimes it is just a couple thousand dollars. And they're like, all right, we'll make that difference. But you want to do it in the offer. If you're in a hot market, you want to make sure that you're saying, hey, and there's a form for this, the 22AD, I believe, in the Northwest MLS forms. And if you're in a different state than Washington, let me know. And I'll kind of I'll send you that form so you can see what the verbiage says. But effectively, it's just saying, hey, if the appraisal comes in low, I will pay X amount of cash to make up that difference. So in this case, it comes in at 330. We're at 335. A notice of low appraisal. What are we going to do? And uh, sometimes they'll meet in the middle. Seller will come down 2500. The buyer will come up with 2500 from a gift from mom and dad or whomever. Um, you know, so there's different ways to massage it through. And and if the seller is going to be obstinate and go, hey, I'm putting it back on the market. I'm not taking 330. I'm going to hold out for 335. You just you have to remind them gently that you know that's a government appraisal. I guess in this our example is conventional, but if it is a government appraisal, that 330 is going to sit in a system for six months, and the next FHA buyer that comes along or VA buyer, guess what? They're going to see that appraisal. They're going to say, "Hey, that house is worth 330." So the seller needs to understand that when they're threatening to put the house back on the market. Conventional loan, not so much, but. Um, I, I just ask people to take a deep breath and really consider their options and let's see if we can get this done quicker. Putting it back on the market, then all of a sudden the market changes and it sits for a, uh, a period, three months, you know, and their mortgage payment is 2000 a month. So they just spent $6,000 to hold out for five. And trust me, that would not shock me at all. I, I see goofy stuff like that all the time. It's just, it's like, wow, humans. We are impressive creatures. So, um, okay, those are the timelines. And really, once you get past that appraisal part and the inspection's cool, the appraisal comes in at value, then you're on the home stretch. Now it's like, okay, now let's talk. Let's make sure that everybody's on the same page. We're going to close on the 31st. And it could be, let's say it's the 25th, and everybody's ready to go. The seller's ready to sign. The buyer's ready to sign. You can do a quick addendum, say, um, if you didn't already, sales shall close on the 31st or sooner. And so everybody can go in tomorrow and sign their loan documents, sign their paperwork, and this thing could fund the next day on the 26th. Um, again, you don't want to do stuff on Fridays because uh, the assessor's office could be closed. And they're the ones that record this closing. They, they record this transaction. That's why they'll call it recording. Um, or, or funding for the lender, recording for the county. But it's when it records and the wire is sent, so money is sent to everybody, and the county says, good, now Alex owns this house, and we've recorded that in our system. Go give him the keys. Congratulations, you're a homeowner. And then you do just that. You know, Go out there. You can bring a gift if you want, a thank you. You can bring the keys out there. Give them a housewarming gift. Don't go overboard and give them $1,000 cash. That will be a problem in a RESPA violation. Real Estate Settlement and Procedures Act, if any of you guys want to go to sleep at night, read that thing because it's long and boring. Um, but, yeah, a gift, a reasonable gift, $300, $500, a gift card to, I don't know, Williams-Sonoma or Walmart, you know, whatever. So you're now at closing, and the deal's done. And when that deal is done and everything's funded, escrow, they've cut checks to everybody, including us. Now, remember, the checks have to come to Kelly Wright unless there's a circumstance where we allow that. Idaho will allow it, but we also want our fees to come to us. We constantly get the wrong fee. And we have to go back and say, okay, well, escrow sent you a check directly, but the fee was wrong. Now you have to pay us a few bucks more. And it, it does complicate things. We pay same day. So why not just have them make the check out or wire it to us, but have them make the check out to Kelly Wright. We'll give instructions. When it comes into our account, we verify it against the file, make sure we've got that earnest money receipt and all the signed documentation. And then boom, we pay you same day. Um, or the next day, depending on the time of the day it comes in. 
But so those are effectively the timelines that, that go into this thing. And, you know, it's roughly a 30-day process. But remember, with all the different moving parts and a lot of humans involved, it can get messy. So as professionals, we have to take the deep breaths and keep everybody engaged and unmessy it. Okay? So if you ever have any of those questions or things go south, which I know everybody does, when things go south, it comes to my desk. And uh, that's always makes for a fun story at night with my wife. Um, okay, so closing, funding, recording, we kind of went over that. And then the gifts and the thank yous and referrals. So the gift is fine. A reasonable gift RESPA allows. You can't buy them a new Ferrari. Um, I guess some, some deals, if you do sell the Space Needle, you probably have that kind of money. But um, a reasonable gift, a gift card, a dinner card at a nice restaurant, things like that are all reasonable. So that's fine. And then the thank you and referrals. I mean, this is, um, I've done a lot of sales training throughout my career, and, um, and now I'm, I'm really kind of teaching it. But sales is really easy when you go after referrals. When you just go out to the public and try to drum up business, it's like it's like looking for loose change and you know you're under your car seat or in the couches. And great, you'll dig and you dig and you get dirty and your fingernails are dirty and you've got 12 cents. Referrals are the dollar bills or five dollar bills. I mean referrals are what you want. So go ask for them. Say thank you. I hope I did a really good job for you. I wanted to make sure this was a smooth transaction. Congratulations on your house. I'm so excited for you and your family. Do you know of anybody in your family, friends, sphere of influence who would be interested in using me as a real estate agent? Buying, selling, helping them with the valuation on their home. Ask for those referrals. And then follow up. Make sure that you know, you asked them, you went over to their house and gave them that gift card and said thank you if you know of anybody, but follow up with an email or another phone call. Stay in touch with them. They are now in your sphere of influence. The average house, the average homeowner owns a house for a little over three years. I think it's 3.3 years. Um, guess what? If you did a good job when they go to sell that house, they're calling you. But you have to stay in touch with them. It's really, really important to stay in touch with them. Ask for referrals. Make sure they remember you. So, you know, they want to associate Joe Kelly with real estate 3.3 years ago. So then Alex calls me from Acapulco. And he's diving on cliffs going, hey, can you help me sell that house that I bought a few years ago? I'm moving down here to Acapulco. Apparently, I can do uh, the triple Lindy off a 700-foot cliff. And they love it. And people are clapping and paying him lots of money to do it. And Alex, if you do a triple Lindy off a cliff, I will pay you money and go down and see that. But so the referrals are fantastic. It's, it's, and it's amazing. People just, they like working with one person. They like referring people. you got to ask for it, okay? So that's referrals. All right, everybody. I'm going to take a sip. It's actually my last sip of water, so that's good. Yeah, I think and when we do marketing, Joe, we can talk a little bit about, um, you know, the a CRM, a simple CRM, like, you know, I, I've used in the past is, uh, is a must, you know, like you're talking about with following up with referrals and keeping track of past and current clients, on, so, on, so on and so forth. Yeah, a CRM, so if you're, if you're not – familiar with that it's just customer relationship um, software customer relationship management something like that yeah I've been using the acronym so long I kind of forgot um, but it's right. about, <laughs> about staying in touch with your customers and so those CRMs are designed to set up drip campaigns and that's what we're trying to develop right now and Alex and I have been talking about this each week we try moving it forward with different developers we'll get there but because I want it to be really simple I want it to be as fundamentally simple as humanly possible. Because if you buy or subscribe to a CRM, and there's lots of them out there, you can just Google see real estate CRMs and they'll charge you 10 bucks a month or 40 bucks a month, whatever it's gonna be. There'll be so many bells, whistles, and buttons on that thing, you'll go, oh my gosh, I, I'm not gonna use any of this stuff. I just wanna send a simple email out once a month saying, I hope everything's going great. Give me a call if you're thinking about real estate. Stop rhyming, and I mean it. Anybody want a peanut? Um, <laughs> so uh, Princess Bride, if you guys don't know. Um, so CRMs are good, and but they're really complicated, and they can be effective, and it does automatically contact your clients. But you know, sometimes it's nice to just write a letter. Sometimes it's nice to send an email. Sometimes it's nice to make a phone call. 
stay in touch. Really good clients that give you referrals. I mean, buy them a bottle of wine. This is our sphere. This is, these are our friends and family. You know, make sure that you um, take care of them. And they'll remember you, of course, and they'll refer business to you. But those are the dollar bills. You know, when someone calls you up and says, yeah, my Uncle Fred's going to list his $500,000 house. Can you help him? It's like, yeah, I can help him. Um, I, I would really like a $15,000 commission. And as all of us know at Kelly Wright Real Estate, you're going to get the best cut of commission. You're going to get the filet mignon cut. So, yeah, go after those referrals. They're, they're really fantastic. Um, can we give a small referral fee or gift? Of course, yeah, yeah. So you can you can always give a small referral uh, fee. Um, it has to be very small though. Make it a gift. Um, it's illegal. It's illegal for you to pay. Um, again, it's, it's, it's such a gray area with RESPA, Real Estate Settlement and Procedures Act. Um, it's such a gray area to give money to people for them to give you referrals or business. Um, that's why the gift part of it is, is reasonable. So yes, of course, you can give them a gift card, say thank you for uh, that referral, I appreciate it. Um, small gift, again, a, a meal. Um, cash is always just goofy. It's, it's, it's like, God, you're moving. I mean, the states get so wigged out by cash. And that's why gift cards are a real good recommendation or, you know, something nice. Uh, it could be flowers, it could be, um, I don't know, a, you know, maybe they're, she's pregnant, they bought the house and give him some baby clothes or blanket or something, you know, give him, he's a lumberjack, give him a new chainsaw that's, you know, a small one that's $300. Something like that is fine. But when you start telling the public, hey, I'm going to give you $5,000, I guess that would be too much, $1,000 if you send referrals to me for me to make money off of, that's going to be, that's going to throw up red flags. So be very careful about those bigger amounts. And, and I, again, you're always safe with a small gift. Okay. So good questions, everybody. I appreciate it. As usual, there's so much that we missed. There's so much else that's out there, but it gives you kind of a, the bare bones minimum of what we're doing when we make an offer, what we're looking for, the paperwork side of it. Um, this is where we get paid to get an offer accepted and then take them through the process to closing and get a check. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty dynamic process. And always remember, we're the professionals. It can be really smooth. It can be really just a huge headache. In fact, while I've been doing this, this conference, this webinar, I've had three or four situations happen. That's why I've been glancing down on my phone over here. I've got a ton of situations I got to get back to. So right, basically between one o'clock and three o'clock, my day is going to be filled with headaches. Um, how I'm going to solve those really makes a big difference. Take a deep breath, um, go through it professionally. Don't get angry at people. Um, keep emotions in check. You can't you can't force your clients to keep their emotions in check but they'll take their cues from you. If you keep them in check and you say, well, this can happen, let's, let's see what happens, let's see if we can fix this, let's move forward. All that kind of stuff really, really helps and that's when they'll go, wow, that agent really, when I got emotional, that agent kept everything together. So, um, ba -ba -ba. okay, Keith, one last question. Hi, Joe, do you have a time, time to help me with bump claws, remarket thingy majigger? That's a good technical question. Um, yeah, Keith, let me get to a few things, and later this afternoon, let's do the bump clause. Um, and let, let me take a look at the actual scenario you have. Okay, so everybody, thank you very much for joining us in this webinar, uh, June 21st, 2017, on basically the selling paperwork, the paperwork we're helping buyers with to get a house and to close on a house. If you have any questions, you can always email me, jkelly at kellywright.com, or call me at the uh, headquarters, 509-489-7000, and uh, send your scenarios to me. Thanks much, everyone. We'll see you next week, which is basically our sales and marketing, how to market yourself and generate more business. So next week's going to be a good one as well. We've been short-staffed all week, so I apologize for the late notice, but uh, we will email out a link to this webinar so you can uh, review it in your the privacy of your own home. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great week.